Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Greetings to you all and um, to the members of the Educational Theory Policy and Practice Research Hub at the University of Canterbury and our guests from around the world, uh, including those affiliated with the AERA Paulo Freire SIG. I know some of you have put your name in the chat or where you're from. Please continue to do that. It's great to see people joining us from around the world. My name is Bernadette Farrell. And along with my co-authors, Maria Carolina Nito Angel and Monica Maciel Val, we have organized this symposium on behalf of the Hub with the guidance of the Hub Chair, Professor Peter Roberts. This symposium, entitled Women in Critical Pedagogy, Reflecting on Uncertain Times, is an initiative, as I said, of the Education Theory Policy and Practice Hub at the University of Canterbury. The presentations today are based on chapters from the recently published book, Critical Pedagogy in Uncertain Times, Hope and Possibilities. It's a copyright here. Um, and this was edited by Sheelam Corinne, who I'll be introducing in a moment. Uh, so before we begin, I would like to thank both Sheila McCrane and Iniasioli um, for agreeing to participate in the symposium and um, their presence has met at quite a popular event. <laughs> Firstly, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Sheila Landers McCrin from the University of Massachusetts in the United States. Sheila is a professor and a cognitive psychologist in the Department of STEM Education and Teacher Development, as I said, at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, where she coordinates the special education program. Her research interests include educational theory, critical pedagogy, special education, embodied cognition, cognitive development, alternative assessment, and the learning sciences. She is a critical feminist who has published numerous articles and books, as well as the recipient of many grants. She is also a licensed and certified school psychologist and a reading specialist. So now for our first uh, symposium presentation, I'd like to turn you all over uh, to Sheila. Thank you, Bernadette. Uh, thank you all for um, participating in this uh, Zoom uh, conference. Um, I am going to talk about critical pedagogy. I'm going to introduce myself and talk about my evolution as a critical pedagogue. Um, so uh, as Bernadette was uh, saying, I'm a professor and I consider myself a critical feminist um, as well as a cognitive psychologist. And for most people that sounds a little incongruous because, uh, you know, being a critical feminist, we're talking about, you know, uh, politics uh, and um, uh, the rights of women and, uh, and that sort of thing. And being a cognitive psychologist and trained school psychologist, I was trained in a, a psychometric um, uh, paradigm. Um, so, uh, I took my first course in, um, in graduate school when I was pursuing my doctorate and uh, I um, was exposed to uh, a professor from University of Penn who uh, introduced me to the work of Henry Giroux. It was one of his first articles from Harvard Ed Review. Um, and uh, I, I started to get really excited because there was language in those articles that helped me express my own thoughts and my curiosity about the sort of psychometric positivism uh, uh, foundations of my training. Um, so as you can imagine, I, I've always been a political person. I protested, you know, at the end of the Vietnam War. I mean, I'm, you know, kind of a, an activist in my own way. Uh, so when I started to hear the language of uh, critical pedagogy, it sort of woke me in the new terms. Um, and uh, I got really excited and I was still pursuing uh, that doctorate in school psychology, but then I uh, took on a second doctorate at the same time so that I could pursue both of these interests. And, and it was quite challenging, but um, uh, uh, I got through it. Uh, and then as a young professor, um, my tenure committee had problems with uh, these two conflicting research arcs. Um, 
in education, some of you are in education, some of you are in other uh, disciplines, um, but education tends to put people in silos and uh, maybe now it's different, but in the 1990s, <laughs> you know, it was like you were tracked in one kind of thing and, and the powers that be didn't quite understand that you could have maybe two interests, three interests. Now I see, I review tenure reviews that have five different interests. So, um, so to make a long story short, uh, when I went up for tenure, uh, they asked me to defend these two conflicting arcs, as they say. So I, I was talking to them about the fact that in special education, the track that I was applying for, at, uh, that I applied for and I got hired for at the university, uh, it was a Jesuit university in Philadelphia. Um, you know, I was teaching about difference. I was talking about difference. I was talking about the multiple ways that oppressed, uh, that um, persons with differences and disabilities are oppressed. And for me, uh, it was a natural link to uh, connect that with a, a social justice model that, you know, kids in schools that had disabilities were oppressed in multiple ways. Um, their families uh, dealt with, uh, you know, horrible situations trying to advocate for their children. So when I was writing my tenure narrative, I, I had to make this case to say that, uh, yes, this is my, my practical training, but I'm also a critical pedagogue that argues and speaks up uh, and defends human rights in schools and then later on in society uh, as, as a whole. Um, and we all know that the sort of reforms that are coming down at schools, we need to be vocal and, uh, and challenge those. So anyway, I, I got through tenure, needless to say. <laughs> it wasn't easy. Um, so uh, I want to tell you about my evolution as a critical pedagogue. And um, I write about this in, in, in the book. Um, so um, as I said, I was exposed to the early books and early writings of Henry Giroux. Uh, in the late 80s when I was a graduate student, so I'm much older than all of you. Um, but um, so uh, I was introduced to Henry's books, The Ideology and Culture and Process of Schooling and Theory and Resistance. And uh, then I started reading Paulo Freire because he, he was linked with Paulo at the time. So then as an assistant professor at St. Joseph's University, Jesuit University I mentioned earlier, in uh, sort of 1994, um, Henry Giroux came to give a lecture. Well, you can imagine how excited I was and the whole auditorium was like electric because he's such a dynamic speaker and he really kind of makes this sort of notion of critical pedagogy and fighting for the rights of, you know, persons that are oppressed. He, 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 was, he was electric to say the least. Um, and um, he, really helped us understand what being critical pedagogy meant and what it could mean for each of us in our own disciplines, in our own silos, as it were. Uh, and, and, and then what it, it holds for individuals and educators and scholars in the you know, wider context in terms of social, historical, and democratic context. Needless to say, Giroux called on each one of us in the, in the audience to work to protect democracy and education for the greater good. And he constantly said that, that, uh, you know, this is for the greater good, greater good. And I, I was hooked. Um, so he traced how the origins of critical pedagogy came about, uh, you know, talking about how when he read Paolo's Pedagogy of the Pressed, that it gave him a new language for understanding conflicts and challenges that he felt faced when he was a high school teacher and later on as an assistant professor. And he said that it marked his own transformation. Uh, and then that led to a lifelong uh, collaboration with Paulo Freire. Uh, actually, he got fired from uh, Boston University for being a critical pedagogue. And, uh, and I actually got fired at, from Montclair State University for being a critical pedagogue. And uh, uh, Antonio Darter said to me, uh, well, Sheila, uh, if you hadn't been fired for your politics at the university, uh, you're not a critical <laughs> critical pedagogue yet. So I feel like I'm part of the, the team now. Um, 
but uh, yeah, when I when I wasn't, uh, I left uh, a tenure track position in Philadelphia to go to um, New Jersey, and they said, "Oh, you don't need to worry about tenure. You know, uh, you know, stay here three years, and then it'll automatically blah blah blah." Well, needless to say, the dean called me and said, "We have enough critical pedagogues here," and I said, "Really? You're telling me that there's enough?" social justice at this university which you know didn't help my case anyway so needless to say i left and went to university of massachusetts um so let me get back so in the 1970s uh Giroux talked about the fact that he began to fashion this uh unique approach to theories of schooling by incorporating the works of the frankfurt school paulo's work radical social theory along with selected works of uh, uh, John Dewey, George Counts, and, and others to construct sort of the foundation of critical pedagogy that we have today. So for clarity with my students and with other scholars, um, there's a history of conflating critical theory with critical pedagogy. It's inevitably uh, a problem. Uh, so critical theory is mainly associated with the Frankfurt School. Um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that. But critical pedagogy is a derivative of critical theory, and it's rooted in the works of Hegel and Kant's critical philosophy, as well as Marx and Engels' writings. And also it's influenced by the British Fabian socialists of the 1800s who aim to solve economic and social ills uh, of the 19th century, rejecting direct confrontation uh, and violent revolution, which is something that really rings true to me today. So Henry is a philosopher and, and a student of, of history, and certainly um, these, uh, you know, different uh, influences kind of help to uh, uh, formalize uh, what their notion of uh, critical uh, pedagogy. So in other words, critical pedagogy didn't inherit the Frankfurt School as is, Rather, it grew out of a collaboration between Giroux and Freire um, and emerged, in, uh, emerged from Freire's work uh, in poverty-stricken Brazil in the 1960s. So um, Henry describes critical pedagogy as an amalgam of liberation theological ethics along with the um, progressive impulses of education uh, from critical theory and the Frankfurt School. Um, and so to quote uh, Henry, he contends that the logic of technocratic rationality suppresses critical function of historical consciousness by denying the possibility of human action grounded in historical insight and committed to emancipation in all spheres of uh, public uh, uh, human activity. Um, so he also adds that traditional and liberal discourses neglected traditional discourses and liberal discourses of schooling, neglected the intersection of culture, power, and knowledge uh, in terms of viewing, teaching, and learning. And he also argued that uh, critical pedagogy is necessary to develop these sort of critical discourses that embrace, embrace pedagogy as a form of cultural politics. And that notion of the intersection uh, really got me excited. And I have a, a new book coming out um, uh, on uh, transnational, fem uh, transnational feminist politics that looks at the intersectionality uh, of uh, oppression of women. Um, and um, that notion of layers and multiple oppressions um, is sort of teased out with this group of international female scholars that are contributing to that book. The idea is that Women are not just oppressed because of color, because of race, because of class, but all of these compounding uh, intersections, it, um, it's described as sort of a bunch of cars coming to an intersection and everybody kind of, you know, crashing together. So the notion of this intersectionality sort of comes clear in, in terms of uh, Henry's uh, critique of traditional and liberal discourses that neglect this intersection of culture, power, and knowledge. And certainly this is now carried over into critical feminist theory in terms of the intersectionality of layered oppressions of women. Um, that's an aside, but um, so on to the present. 
this past year, we celebrated the 50th last year, the 50th anniversary of Paulo Freire's landmark Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And next year, it, 2021, is the 100th birthday of the maestro. Um, his book sold over a million copies and was translated into numerous languages on six continents. Uh, it's emerged as one of the uh, foundations of critical pedagogy and endures, uh, uh, it's had an enduring influence on educators world, worldwide. So Freire's vision of democratic education was not simply about teaching and learning of content or a banking model where students become, students are seen as empty vessels. Rather, he talked about education as participatory, um, that, uh, you know, sort of this interaction, this dialogical uh, understanding to awaken uh, our understanding uh, and the transformative uh, influences of what education can be in the process of learning and and, and the stakeholders in terms of uh, involving all in this transformative right to education. Um, so, uh, sorry for saying I'm old. <laughs> the critical notion of education for the greater good understands that democratic public schooling is the seedbed uh, for new knowledge and culture leading to new selves, new societies, a new population that is more humane. Certainly, it rings true today. Uh, Paulo talked about radical dream, uh, and his radical dream was for democratic public education that stands in stark contrast to what our current neoliberal trends and school reforms are all about today in terms of privatization, standardization, scripted curriculum, uh, and otherwise uh, what Henry calls the de-skilling, uh, the disenfranchises and disenfranchising of teachers and students. Um, and, uh, you know, it's almost like we're gagging teachers and taking away their uh, professionalism, their intellectualism, and, you know, there's a, a lack of trust there in terms of uh, allowing teachers to, to educate as, as we, we would like. Um, so in terms of the neoliberal doctrine, uh, Freire talks about the fact that it limits education to techni technocratic practice. This technocratic practice, as I mentioned earlier, is really making a big comeback. I mean, I spoke about this in the 1990s when I wrote about these skilling uh, teachers and, you know, uh, gagging teachers and not allowing them to make decisions. And, um, you know, we're, we are back there now with the, with the privatization, scripted lessons, etc. So uh, it, this notion of the neoliberal rule that uh, Freire refers to uh, talks about uh, opportunities for change in education and schooling become invisible and our role in fostering that change becomes absent uh, when we don't actively uh, participate in, in making change and becoming change agents ourselves. Uh, so today schooling and public education is stripped of its transformative potential. Um, it's a it's a sad state of affairs. I don't know about uh, globally, but I, I know talking with colleagues in other countries that that this is uh, happening in Europe and South America, and certainly uh, and down under, as we say. So, as we enter this third decade of the 21st century, I believe in my heart of hearts that we need critical pedagogy more than ever. Um, the neoliberal sort of trend or the neoliberal turn uh, has created insecurity and uh, this insecurity in terms of economic or uh, you know the insecurity of protectionism that we're hearing uh, in, in you know the rumble uh, is fused with the anti-immigration racist sexist and uh, has resulted in a knee-jerk return to neo-fascism and uh, neo-nationalism. Um, for example, the, the, um, the right-wing shifts in many nations, for instance, I can point to the illiberal democracy of Hungary. They just have this whole thing about maintaining this eugenetic sort of genetic purity, um, you know, you know, against the, the onslaught, as they call it, so-called onslaught of uh, 
migrants and, and refugees that are coming into their country uh, and saying that they're putting up these walls, you know, a la Trump, I guess they really got a head start on it. Uh, but one has to think about how this harkens back to uh, Nazi rhetoric and how the people in Germany bought it hook, line and sinker because they wanted to protect their country. They wanted to protect their culture, their, their genetic purity, whatever. This same language is now uh, infiltrating countries because of a triangulation of neoliberalism, authoritarianism, uh, conservatism, um, you know, the religious uh, fanatics uh, are really taking hold of the hegemonic messages that are being put out there by politicians, uh, by the media. Another example is in Sweden. I, I have a colleague that I work with very closely in Sweden, and she's telling me that local politicians are not even hiding the fact that they're Nazis, and they're getting voted into office with this whole notion of protectionism. We have to protect our, our culture, our genetic uh, you know, um, purity, et cetera. It's just, again, this whole, uh, Henry calls neo-fascist, um, you know, dangerous times, uh, dark times, like uh, uh, Arden talks about. Um, so I believe that critical pedagogy has increasing pertinence today in face of this erosion of humanity, uh, of fairness, uh, of democracy in itself, uh, and actually of the public sphere um, that we're headed in an anti uh, uh, or post democracy. Um, uh, I think that this notion of post democracy is that countries will feign democratic elections, uh, sort of mimic democratic uh, policies, uh, but at the same time, there's a, a a dangerous undercurrent that is sort of um, there uh, under, under, underneath it all. So neoliberalism has sort of normalized neo-fascism in our sort of uh, post-democracy and post-truth era. And uh, the neo-fascists, uh, as I was referring to, sort of have tapped into this collective suffering uh, economic suffering, anxiety of uh, people that are frightened by, uh, you know, this recent, uh, you know, million person global multiple country refugee crisis. Um, and uh, the politicians and sort of the rhetoric has been able to redirect their anger and their despair through a culture of fear and a culture of silence a discourse of dehumanization uh, and turning critical ideas uh, into a sort of the ashes of history um, and uh, through sort of the dissemination of a toxic mix of uh, racialized, uh, uh, racialized categories, ignorance, and sort of this rise of uh, militaristic uh, white nationalism that is sort of, um, uh, it's, it's, it's epidemic. Another example any will be talking about is conservative government in Brazil um, that's denied human rights and uh, has actually, uh, uh, she writes about it in the book about how tragically Paulo Freire's legacy, his teaching, his philosophy have been erased. Uh, Paulo Freire was the patron of education in Brazil uh, and now it's being erased from curriculum and books and even uh, governments are going to the point where they're actually threatening uh, teachers who, uh, who continue to teach and refer to his teachings. So um, to kind of pull this all together, I think that uh, critical pedagogues need to stand up uh, and uh, that they need to recognize, uh, you know, our sort of neoliberal turn in our politics and the resultant policies that come along with that. Um, and uh, the 
fuel that neoliberalism has given to nationalism, authoritarianism, sexism, racism, uh, through right-wing populism. Um, so critical pedagogues are committed to analyzing these issues and um, trying to become active against the forces of neoliberal imperial privatization uh, and uh, in society in general and then in education. And um, sort of uh, the world's current precarity and uncertainty has been brought about by Western culture is sort of unrelenting adherences to this neoliberal and neoconservative turn. And this has been exacerbated by the pandemic um, and also the murder of George Floyd and the rise in persons taking to the streets and protesting. So there is this you know, uneven balance between sort of the politician's view of how things are supposed to be, this, you know, profits over people, this, you know, um, notion of people not being persons, that corporations now are persons and people are just people, <laughs> um, that uh, I believe that adopting a critical pedagogy uh, agenda uh, will offer hope uh, and give us possibilities for a renewed democratic, for the renewal of democratic ideals by providing insights, understandings, and hope for the future by looking back at what went before us and what that is going to look like if we continue down this road. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a very precarious situation uh, we are in. Um, but uh, I think I'll wrap this up here and say thank you for allowing me to speak and revisit my critical passions and critical hopes for the future. Um, my evolution as a critical pedagogue has been a labor of love um, as we work to claim, reclaim, and elucidate critical pedagogy's relevance today. And I just want to end with this short quote uh, from Paulo's prophetic words that ring truer today than ever. He says, there is no change without dreams just as there's no dreams without hope. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. <laughs> um, <laughs> great, that was wonderful. Thank um, you. Some really great insights. Um, now we have some short time for questions. I, I really haven't got a question. Um, I've more got, a, I, I suppose, a comment. That was absolutely amazing. Um, I, you said you're older than most of us. I don't, I don't know that that's entirely true. The things <laughs> around the screen that, that may even be older than you think we are, or that you are. Um, but as I listened, I just, uh, it's, really, it's quite interesting because I, I don't want to talk too long. Um, I came from a special ed background as well, and I ended up uh, through a circuitous route sort of at the University of Canterbury. And, um, when I was very ancient doing a doctorate, I didn't want to do what was kind of special ed then, which was around psychology and behavior, and, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. And I ended up getting caught up in philosophy of education, which sort of became a, a different way, a, different, a similar but different thing. But um, as I was listening to you speak, and, and as I, 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 was in, I was entranced, excited, um, inspired, but then as, as you went on, I became, as we do, depressed, uh, miserable, saddened by, by what we seem to be dealing with. And then you, you pull out that lovely quote of um, Freire's. So what are the dreams and what is the hope? Do you think? You want me to respond to that or do you have some ideas about it? I don't, no, I don't. I, I guess, in fact, it's probably rhetorical because it probably isn't time to, to, to think, but I, it, it's a question that always that I find, uh, I find that one of the battles really is that you're doing this amazing work, but how do we get this work to the people who are out there on the ground? Um, you know, it's the interesting. The education, so students themselves are quite resistant. Um, yeah. They it's want to be taught how to do it. Yeah, it's fascinating that you bring this up because uh, Antonia and Darter and I were talking about the fact, and I mentioned this to Bernadette and to Annie and others, that... Um, you know, critical pedagogy is kind of taking a back seat 
And I, I have sort of an idea about that. Um, when you see people writing about critical pedagogy, they mention all of the males, you know, Peter, Henry, Donaldo, you know, uh, Michael Apple, you know, the rest of them, but they don't mention any of us women that we've been there in the trenches writing. And I think that um, even when I read some of these doctoral dissertations and everything, people don't even quote Henry anymore. It's like secondary kind of uh, references to people. I think uh, as professors and, and, and having students, they need to read historical stuff. They need to go back to critical theory. They need to read the Frankfurt School stuff. They need to understand the evolution, uh, uh, like you said, of educational philosophy. Um, but I think that had the women in critical pedagogy, and certainly I don't consider myself the first generation, I consider myself like a second generation um, critical pedagogue, but I think that if more women had been welcomed into the club, that we would have been able to maybe get the information out there better. Uh, I don't know how to explain to you, but I feel very frustrated in the fact that, um, you know, this is a model. It's a model for critique. It's a framework for what should happen. It tells us what transformative education should look like. And it also asks us to stand up, uh, you know, not to sit in our ivy towers and sort of pontificate, but really to get out there and to be active uh, and, you know, I know it's hard. I got fired. You know, I mean, if you are political, you're going to rub up against the powers that be. But if not for us, if not for us, you know, engaging, writing, doing these type of conversations and talking and getting more women and men involved in critical pedagogy and understanding the power that we have collectively supporting each other, citing each other having our students read historical, uh, you know, stuff about how education, you know, comes out of this positivist notion, uh, how we, you know, we're, we, we don't see students as empty vessels, you know, that we are engaged in this dialectical dance with our students, that we empower students through knowledge, that we empower students through this interactive passion that we have for the pursuit of education and scholarship. So I, I'm not answering your question directly, but I think that we lost something in the moves from the excitement of the 1990s and now we're in 2020 and you don't hear about it. You don't hear about critical pedagogy. The graduate students are not reading about critical pedagogy. They're not reading uh, I mean, you, you would probably know better than most of us with the, in educational philosophy. I mean, it just seems like um, the, the destruction and the school reforms, you know, testing and assessment and all, and AERA, I'm, I'm the chair of the Frere SIG, and AERA, you know, I call us the little engine that could. I was the chair of the Marxist SIG for years. Um, <laughs> you know, the little engine that could in this big bureaucratic machine to have a place that has alternative voices. Because the people that are successful in getting all the awards at AERA are doing quantitative data crunching of big tests. Yes. And so, you know, it is a machine that is frightening. It's very strong. Uh, but I think that as more of us talk about this transnational partnerships, uh, getting, you know, all of us, like-minded people and certainly this these type of conferences and dialogues mm -hmm. we talked about bernadette having more of these um will help us to have confidence in ourselves and then demand of our students that they do the work that they do the reading that they you know uh not it's not pay for play in other words at our university if a graduate student is working all day and they pay for tuition they want to get they, they come in and they don't even do the reading yeah. so i think that we've let that slippery slope happen and you know we're carrying the burden of trying to explain and get them passionate and excited but at the same time i think um we need to uh, step up do the work and demand uh, our students to do the reading and make sure that they know what they're talking about and i don't know what else to say does anybody no, else have thank you that's wonderful wonderful thank you sheila and thank you trish i'm afraid um, we have some more questions but we're going to have to move on just with time i know andre and maria have some questions 
but um, if you'd like to email them on um, to Sheila afterwards, uh, as we said, we'd appreciate um, any conversation by email and we might do something more conversational again in the future. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Sheila, for, for, um, for that great presentation. Um, we're going to move on now and for our next presentation, I'd like to welcome Ini Asioli, whose um, presentation is entitled The Attacks on the Legacy of Paulo Freire in Brazil, Why He Still Disturbs So Many. Um, Ini has a PhD in education from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. She is Professor of Education at the Fluminense Federal University, also in Brazil. Her research focus on critical pedagogy incorporates a multi multidisciplinary perspective that relates environmental education, grassroots movements, policy analysis, and international and comparative education. She is a member of the AERA, and in 2020, she was elected the program chair uh, for the Paulo Freire Special Interest Group. Her upcoming book, uh, Normalcy in the New Normal, Education, Equality, and Ethics After the Pandemic, is edited with Dr. Donaldo Macedo. Uh, so now I'd like to turn you over uh, to Inni, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. <laughs> Here in Brazil, it's a Wednesday at 6.42 p.m. I am Rio de Janeiro now, and I'm very happy to talk to an audience of people from different parts of the world, how powerful it can be. <laughs> Firstly, um, I want to uh, thank you, the organizers, uh, for organizing this important symposium. And I am very honored to be here and to dialogue with such amazing, powerful intellectuals. And I will talk a little about the, the chapter I wrote for this amazing book that Sheila edited. <laughs> but also I have to talk about what's going on in Brazil now. Um, the attacks on the legacy of Paulo Freire in Brazil, why he's still disturbing so many? That's a good question. Why is Paulo Freire thought attacked after 20 years of his death? Well, during the 50s and the 60s, the problem of illiteracy was central to Freire's work. But uh, why did he put so much effort into tackling the problem of illiteracy? And this effort put him in jail in 1964 when the dictatorship started in Brazil. And then he was forced into exile for 16 years. And because that, at that time, uh, the literacy rate in Brazil was around 40%. And the illiterate uh, had no right to vote during elections. This means that the governments were not concerned with meeting their needs. So there was no interest in providing access to schooling. And poverty levels remained very high, especially in Northeast Brazil, where Freire was born, and where he developed the literacy project of Angicos, which succeeded on teaching more than 300 rural workers during a 40 hours program how to read, write, and fight for their rights. So it was a very strategic political action aiming at transforming that people's reality. But it disturbed the elite's political interests because they had to deal with poor people voting, organizing themselves and fighting for rights. And Freddy's work is very strategic for collective political action. That's why he is still being an important reference for grassroots movements. Um, the dialect process of denunciation and announcement, denunciation of the unjust social reality, that is the first step for announcing concrete projects, which Freire called untested feasibility, projects for transforming the class society. Because Brazilian society has been forged by 500 years of racism, exclusion, inequality, violence, and authoritarianism. Their threat has persisted regardless of changes in the political regime. 
And today in Brazil, the ultra-conservative right is in power. It is an expression of the alliances between the neoliberal right and the authoritarian radical right. And they defend the Christian traditional family against the state. Some of them criticizes human rights policies, expressing aversion to social movements. Some persecute teachers for indoctrinating students with gender ideology or cultural Marxism. And some of them put forward the defense of military dictatorship and just justification of torture. And for all of them, Paulo Freire is the responsible for a moral degradation. But why Paulo Freire? For example, many teacher education programs don't teach Freire's work. It's, it's not possible to affirm that Freire's thought was really pr present on Brazilian education policies during the last years. Using some keywords like autonomy, dialogue, participation, doesn't mean that the radicality of Freire's work is being understood and put in practice. And the coronavirus crisis unveils the obscene degree of inequality, intolerance, racism, exploitation of workers, and also the contempt that the rulers have for people's lives. And the president in Brazil heads the coronavirus denial group and conducts a, a real genocide. From March until now, it had been reported more 81,000 deaths from coronavirus. More than 2 million people was infected. And the researchers affirmed that the number of cases may be 14 times higher due to underreporting especially in poor communities and favelas. And during this genocide, the government approval rate is around 40%. And the highest approval rate is in the group of the unemployed and people without a stable income. And these are the ones who are forced to take crowded public transportation trying to find ways for surviving. The ones that depend on the overcrowded public hospitals that lack personal protective equipment in case of being infected or with coronavirus. So this is the sadistic face of government that pushes thousands of people to death while convinced that rescue the economy must be the priority. It's a fascist government. So Freire's concept of banking education is so important to analyze this situation because we are witnesses of the results of a massive system of banking education that by increasing the population's level of education made it possible to increase alienation and exploitation. And we are witnessing the tragic situation in which the worker chooses to walk toward his own annihilation. Banking education can, cannot hide its necrophilic imprint. By turning its students into recipient of content, it, it cannot hide its purpose of reproducing oppression and control. And we can now notice how did the banking education system in Brazil contribute to the fascist government to, to get in power. For example, the banking education system resulted in an educated generation that ignores the Brazilian history. And this can partly explain why some groups claim for the return of the military dictatorship, which in Brazil went from 1964 to 1985. And there is also an educated generation that ignores the basic fundamentals of science. And that's why many people reply anti-scientific discourses, even during this tragic pandemic. And there is an educated generation that 
cannot critically analyze the news, the difference between facts and opinions. And this is a perfect scenario for fake news. So banking education transforms the right to education into the right of having a certification. What does it mean to consider, it, to consider education as a right? And I understand that the right to education is related to all human rights. And banking education restricts the right to education merely to receive degrees, certification. It has serious impact on the assurance of human rights and human rights for all humans. Banking education also has serious impact on nature. How do we learn to relate to the environment? How do we learn to relate to the other beings? This is a dehumanizing process. And the act of knowing with the purpose of humanization, of being more, in Freire's words, uh, presupposes a dialogical situation. And the real dialogue, it's, it's not just exchange words. It involves gestures and affections that are collectively constructed and cannot be restricted to teacher-student's relationship. And precisely for this reason, a teaching learning process that takes place remotely or online without the presence that enable these rich and complex interactions should not be accepted because as it breaks the spatial and temporal dimensions that connect people, Remote learning re reinforces individualism. It has grave consequence for democracy. For example, when teachers get together face to face, they can openly talk about their working conditions, their wages, the exploitation of teachers' work. They can organize themselves into unions. And when students get together, they can mobilize in defense of democracy, of public and quality education. This is why on, on one of the military's dictatorship strategies was to prohibit people from gathering in groups. Also, online learning restricts education to content delivery. It's an online banking education. How many school and university students are unable to access real-time discussions with their teachers and their colleagues? Internet connection problems, lack of technological equipment, the need to do housework and take care of children and family, unemployment, mental illness. These are some problems that teachers and students are facing worldwide. What are the real possibilities for critical education in this scenario? Is it really possible? And in Brazil, this situation is dramatic because more than 50% of population is unemployed. Because of this, many teachers and unions are against the substitution of face-to-face -face classes for online classes because it condemns many students to stay behind and give up studying. And this, is, this increases inequality. And I cannot be conniving with this. And in Brazil, our best universities are the public universities and they are complete, completely free. Over the past 10 years, the access of low-income students to federal universities has increased so that more than 50% of the federal university students are the first in their family to attend the university. And the Brazilian federal constitution states that public universities are based on teaching, research and extension. And extension involves activities in which academic knowledge interacts with community knowledge. And this is important for the university to carry out its social, fu social function of 
facing the social problems in favor of the public good, not the private interests. And Freire was an important defender of the public and free university, of the public good, of democracy at universities and schools. He was a defender of the importance of the grassroots movements. Also, he acted to strengthen the national student movement, the national student union. In Pedagogy of Freedom, Freire affirmed that the kind of education that does not recognize the right to express appropriate anger against injustice, against disloyalty, against the negation of love, against exploitation and against the violence, fails to see the educational role in policing this expression of this feeling, these feelings. So it's time to express appropriate anger, to recognize how important it is for democracy. We must teach and learn how to transform the appropriate anger into revolutionary consciousness so that we can find alternative ways against the current exacerbated individualism that is taught at neoliberal schools and universities. And this is only possible by democratizing access to public and free basic and higher education for the popular classes, the minorities, the marginalized. And in this way, the grassroots movements, the peasant and the indigenous movement, the feminist movements, the black movements, the unions, the movements for environmental justice, they must have active and permanent presence in schools and universities in such a way that students can join them and learn about self-organization, tolerance, respect for divergent thinking, and learn strategies of struggle and claim. We are living hard times. So it's time to construct a, a curriculum for survival and resistance to face the current threats to life. Police brutality, forced displacement, feminicide, land grabbing and all kinds of violations of rights. Uh, that's why Freire is still disturbing so many. Because in order to advance the neoliberal agenda of attacks to public education, attacks to human rights, it was necessary to repeatedly attack and destroy Freire's legacy. And that's why in Brazil, the defense of Freire's legacy became an enduring symbol for defending the right to education, the public good. And above all, uh, it became a symbol for the defense of the right to life. So thank you. Thank you, Annie. That was a very powerful presentation. Um, would anyone um, like to ask a question? We, we don't have a lot of time, maybe for a question, a comment. And uh, um, as I said, we, we'd all, I know Annie has said that she will happily uh, respond to any emails as well. Um, Gertrude has her hand up there. Gertrude, would you like to ask a question or make a comment? Gertrude Cotter. You have to unmute your microphone first, Gertrude. <laughs> No. Would, would any, Gertrude, do you still want to ask a question? Oh, see above, my sound's not good. Okay, uh, let me just check out. Um, Gertrude's question is written in the chat box, so I'll read it out. Uh, is the average third level student in Brazil voting for Bolsonaro? Um, 
Yeah. Frank Briskeel asked why um, the masses are attracted to fascism and Nazism and why the working classes do not rebel against the owners of capital and the persistence of their domination. In other words, why do we give power to the things that turn us into less, and uh, to less free and less capable human beings? When I hear about, for instance, Brazil, Hungary or the US today, I am asking the same question. What are some answers? It's a big question, Innie. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you for the questions. Well, we are living in hard times and it's not easy to, to transform this reality. And in Brazil, people are supporting Bolsonaro and in the US, people are supporting Trump. And I always ask myself, why? Why and what can we do about, about it? We are educators and we, we have some... Uh, we have some responsibility um, with, on trying to overcome this, but it's not a simple, uh, simple situation. But I don't know. I think that uh, we must. Uh, uh, yes, we need to revolutionize to, to revolutionize uh, education system, and we only can do this with uh, by, by uh, gathering the popular uh, movements the grassroots movements the ones that are are out of education systems they are out of out out of out, out of uh, the right to education and we must uh, struggle for the right of the ones that are out of the education system and uh, and try to 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 gather with them and to to democratize the democratize uh, education. For example, now I ha I have some university students and they are, they are living under very vulnerable conditions. They uh, uh, they only can study and attend university. Uh, because they live in an, in an occupation. They occupy a land, they live there, and it's the only opportunity for them to continue studying and to graduate. And their situation is it's very difficult. Sometimes they, they have nothing to eat, and, and the university, uh, is trying to remove them from this place. So they are being attacked on the right to study on higher education. And yesterday I was with them talking to them, how can uh, we, uh, how can we be together and fighting for their rights to keep studying? And uh, it's not easy because uh, sometimes it can be very dangerous because where they are living now, it's like a, it's, uh, there are some criminal factions, there are lots of uh, strange interests that want to, to uh, own that land. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a treat to their lives, but also um, they are very they, they are cordials. They, they want to, to struggle for their rights and they want to stay there fighting for their rights. So I am supporting them. I am supporting them with, I don't know, my knowledge, uh, my, my, my uh, network of researchers. And uh, we are uh, meeting with them and some groups of researchers to find ways how to build a network of support uh, for these students. And they are trying to record the documentary about their struggle. And uh, I am looking for some uh, people that can help them to record, this, to record this documentary. So we are trying to find ways of uh, guarantee their right to uh, study and they are fighting and their fight teach them and their fight teach me. They are my masters, they are my professors. I'm learning a lot with them. 
So um, I, I don't know, the right to education is not something guaranteed uh, here in Brazil. And uh, I think um, it, it's, it's something, it, this is something that happens in other countries too. So how can we be together with these people that uh, hasn't the right to education, that they are fighting for this right? It's not easy. Sometimes it, 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 it threatens our lives, our safety. I, I, I fear, yes, I fear. I, I fear of being uh, fired, but uh, I don't know. It's, um, it's, it's like I, I have to do this. I, I must do this. It's their right. And I am a professor. Why I am a professor, if not to guarantee the rights of my students? So I don't know. <laughs> But um, uh, we can uh, uh, keep talking and I will be very happy to keep talking with you by email and, and Facebook and to keep in contact because it's very important for us in Brazil to, to build, to construct a network of solidarity because our democracy is under real attack. And I think that this network of solidarity is very important to, for us, especially at this moment. Thank, thank you, Annie. That was brilliant. <laughs> and we've had, had a lot of comments in the chat box as well, people supporting um, and very excited about what you're saying and uh, thanking you for a wonderful presentation as well. Um, Unfortunately, again, with time and constraints and the nature of this, we don't really have time to ask any more questions. But as Annie said, please, um, all of the presenters are very open to getting emails and continuing this conversation. Uh, these are important conversations for us all. So thank you, Annie. Um, we're going to move on now to the last presentation. Uh, so just bear with me a second. Um, so finally, um, I'd like to introduce uh, the presentation entitled Learning to Disagree, Critical Pedagogy, Dialogue and Tolerance. Um, and I'm part of this presentation, so you'll be fed up of listening to me by the end. <laughs> um, we are Maria Carolina Nizzo Angel and uh, Monica Maciel Val and myself, Bernadette Farrell. Uh, we're respectively <coughs> excuse me, from Colombia, Brazil and Ireland. Uh, we all completed our PhDs at the University of Canterbury in 2018. Um, however, we continue to work together um, as we go about our lives post-PhD. Um, today, Maria joins us from Colombia. Monica is in Christchurch, and I am in the southernmost part of New Zealand, uh, in Invercargill. Um, the three of us will be presenting today, and because of that, we're going to um, use uh, Prezi. So I'm going to share that on the screen now. Um, so you should be all seeing your the Prezi on the screen now. Yeah. Great. So to begin with, I'm going to turn over to Monica, uh, who's going to take us through. Thank you. Yora. Olá. Um, I just want to thank you all for being here and for attending the symposium and stay with us until now to engage with our work. So I am here with my friends Maria and Bernadette to share some of the things we have been thinking and doing together. And we're going to be discussing how can we learn to disagree and critical pedagogy, dialogue and tolerance. We want to start by sharing some of our tapestries how we came to be together and what is the context informing our practices. We started working together four years ago while we were all doing our PhDs at University of Canterbury. We formed a little study group and the purpose of our study group was to read Paulo Freire's work and try to develop our own understanding about what Freire was saying. The group fulfilled and fulfills both our intellectual and an emotional need. With the group, we have a space to develop arguments, to listen, to agree, and to disagree with each other. And with the group, we also have a space to share feelings, to laugh, and to cry together.
with time, or the focus of our group change. We move from trying to understand what Freddie was saying to try to use, to try to engage with Freddie's work to understand our own reality and to act in our own reality. And something that all of us were experiencing was increasing polarization. Being from Brazil, from Colombia, in for Ireland, some of the things that impact us were the decision from the UK to leave the European Union, the rejection of the peace agreement in Colombia, and the election of Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. In those contexts of polarization, dialogue was being lost. And we start to think, how can we foster an education for disagreement? How can we experience disagreement and how can we help our students to experience disagreement, not as a way of closing the door for dialogue, but as a meaningful matter of engaging with each other. We started our exploration, trying to see the connections between the ideas of knowing, dialogue and disagreement. We felt that it was important to acknowledge that we have in our societies a widespread disregard for the truth. And this can be in different levels. For example, it can be denying the legacy of colonization, or it can also be spreading fake news on social media. Considering that we do have this widespread disregard for the truth, how can we come to know? We believe that one possibility is through curiosity, is to keep ourselves curious about our own knowledge, about others, and about the world. But curiosity by itself is not enough. We also need uncertainty. Freire would uh, argue for being not too certain of our certainties. So we feel that it is also important to be humble, to acknowledge that we don't know everything and to also acknowledge that even the things we do know, the knowledge we do have is historical knowledge, is knowledge in process. For Freire, we are not just in the world, but with the world and with each other. He would say that human beings are not building silence, but in word, in work, in action reflection. So uh, for us, the developing of new understandings, of more complex understandings of our realities is a collective work. It's something that we do together and not something that we're gonna do in isolation. Frey was against a culture of silence. For him, denying conflict, denying difference, denying disagreement, are all signs of oppression. Hobart is going to argue that dialogue depends on difference and we are going to agree. In this way, dialogue is a social process. It's something that we engage not to push our point of view, not to conquer others, not to prove that we have the best argument, but something that we do to engage, to connect, to learn and grow. So I'm going to talk about re-establishing dialogue as an ethical practice. As an ethical imperative, we cannot choose to respect only those who share the same values and ideas as us, but this is not the same as ignoring or accepting oppressive conditions. I want to talk about balancing anger, tolerance and solidarity. We recognize the difficulty of, what we, of implementing what we are proposing. We acknowledge that we may try and maybe succeed and maybe fail, but we are historical beings capable of intervening in and knowing the world. A part of history and yet open and capable of producing something that does not yet exist. And they're Freire's words. We use the term balance as Freire did when he spoke of a balanced dosage. This is a balance between opposites intention, 
which is necessary in the struggle for change in dehumanizing and oppressive contexts. Freire specifically, uh, referred specifically to a balanced dosage of both patience and impatience to maintain the possibility of change. Understanding change as a permanent struggle rather than as an accomplished state of equilibrium. Similarly, a balanced dosage of both tolerance and anger is a permanent struggle, but necessary to build transformation. In the fast paced world of social media, reducing polarization is often achieved through avoiding any type of positionality. In other words, claiming neutrality. An appearance of sameness, however, generates oppression by silencing dissent and hindering our ability to name the world and therefore change the world. Freire recognizes the need, the need for polarities, but criticizes polarization. In Pedagogy of the Heart, for example, he argues that being in favor of something or someone, I am necessarily against someone. Thus, it is necessary to ask, against what and with whom am I? In this statement, Freire points out that a person who knows their positionality also understands the necessity of the polarity in favour of or against. Dialogue demands distinct positions and opportunities for dissent. Taking a position when it emanates from a process of conscious and critical reflection is part of authentic and democratic dialogue. In Freire's later work, he paid particular attention to educational virtues. A virtues approach underpins Freire's concepts of dialogue, praxis and critical consciousness and his commitment to social justice and democracy. Freire argues that being tolerant does not mean acquiescing to the intolerable. It does not mean covering up disrespect. It does not mean coddling the aggressor or disguising aggression. He argues that tolerance is the virtue that teaches us to live with difference and learn from it. Being tolerant means to authentically and respectfully engage with differences and disagreement, to learn from each other. One learns tolerance by practicing it, as the learning of tolerance takes place through testimony. Tolerance, when understood as a revolutionary virtue, requires a belief in the abilities of others. It is founded on respect for others and in respecting differences. But it is not merely passive acceptance or agreement with other points of view. It is, however, a commitment to engage with others. And again, as Robert argues, as critical beings, we may still judge the worth and indeed accuracy of contributions. Balancing the need to be tolerant and the right to be angry about oppression can be challenging. But there are limits to tolerance. Freire argues coherence between what we say and what we do sets limits to tolerance and keeps it from derailing into connivance. To speak truthfully, there must be coherence between what we say and what we do. One of the keys to balancing tolerance, disagreement and anger is to think about our purpose, which for Freire is humanization or becoming more fully human. When we face the intolerable, we must not dehumanize others. If we dehumanize anyone, we inevitably dehumanize ourselves. When the possibility to reflect, dialogue and act in the struggle against oppression is interrupted or deformed, so too is the process of becoming. This cannot be acceptable to the critical educator. Tolerance then has its limits. The virtue of openness is also necessary to learn how to disagree with others while navigating controversy and increasing polarization. It means being permanently open to others, to the word and the world. It means avoiding being too certain. It is impossible to be open to the world and not be aware of our unfinishedness. For Freire, openness is an approach to life. It comprises respect for difference, but also coherence between what is said and what is done. It is a feature of a critical open mind. It is an openness to reason, but also emotion and desire, an openness to our whole self and that of the other. As with tolerance, there are limits to openness. As, 
as Roberts argues, openness does not mean that anything is acceptable. It requires discipline. It is critical and reflective. Openness does not mean believing in everything. It requires criticality, but it does leave us open to changing our minds. So our question has been, how we dare to educate while we learn to disagree? Um, so Freire conceived the notion of a contradictory historical space as um, dramatic coexistence of backwardness and misery, poverty, democracy, authoritarianism, modernity, and postmodernity, which requires educators whenever presented with a decision to make, to take position, to rupture, to opt. Taking a position does not deny the possibility of dialogue in the process of unveiling of realities. Authentic dialogue needs disagreement, needs a students free to question and pose problems in a climate of mutual respect. According to Freire, progressive educators must avoid reducing education to the transfer of contents to guarantee what he called a happy life. For example, naive societies believe that colonial structures and mind frames are things of the past and finding such comfort eventually evade conscientization. Educating for critical consciousness where both the educator and the learner are capable of questioning entrenched beliefs is difficult and demands the conscious development of virtues. Love, according to Freire, underpins all other educational virtues. But even with armed love, Teaching for disagreement and dialogue, for freedom and for truth is difficult because it entails risk and can generate fear. However, Freire proposed not allowing fear to paralyze us, implying that teachers who teach in contradictory historical spaces need to recognize the intellectual and the emotional complexity intrinsic in the act of educating and denouncing. Educating for disagreement and tolerance entails acknowledging the whole teacher and the whole le learner as both enter an exploration of the world with others. To nurture the attitude of curiosity toward life requires the ability of the part of educators to support the process of knowing as the students grow from the tension between deciding to know more and fear to deepen their understanding when contentious issues provoke contradictory emotions. Freire invited educators to face the risk of deepening disagreement towards more complex and profound composition of the truth, where the notion of compositions, according to Freire, entails interacting as a creative process. Obstacles in polarized societies are not only of intellectual nature, but of an emotional nature. For Freire, educators should collaborate with the learner to experience the type of disagreement that would cause anger, as Amy said, but also to experience the type of disagreement that would cause solidarity, as she also said. Together with educators and learner, we find the abilities for critical analysis without avoiding positionality, but remaining aware of dogma and polarization. They together need to realize that aiming for unveiling the truth humanizes us. This framework, which we explain in our chapter, illustrates the creative tension of learning to disagree as a continuum and the role of both critical pedagogy and participatory action research in supporting holistic participatory and dialogical approach to co-constructive knowledge. In the context of polarized societies, we might find greater tension in the quadrant where authoritarian positions, even from the teacher, tend to impose unilateral visions of reality. However, progressive educators will skillfully propose disagreements and evolve toward construction 
co-construction of knowledge. In our chapter, we illustrated a classroom potentially useful to learn about disagreement and tolerance, but with no simple resolution. We'll start there, we believe that supporting the development of emancipatory consciousness does not aspire to create perfect order in the classroom or the society at, at large. However, the capacity of teachers to understand the complexity of the unveiling of realities for students is a space of vulnerability and therefore an opportunity to care. Complexity entails both cognitive and affective processes. For example, acknowledgement rather than denial, empathizing rather than judging. In conclusion, we would argue that in highly polarized societies where teachers need to dare to offer educational opportunities that engage students in critical reflection, the creative and intuitive abilities of teachers become crucial. Now we would like to invite you to share your experiences with dialogue and disagreement. Thank you very much. So thank you. That's um, our presentation. Um, sorry, it's thunder and lightning here in Invercargill at the moment, so you might have, hear some background noise. Um, we have time for maybe one question or comment before we have to uh, um, finish the uh, session. Um, is there anyone that would like to make a comment or question or, or share indeed a, an experience with dialogue and disagreement? Yes, Alicia. Yeah. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for this wonderful session where we, we hear very good ideas and summaries and uh, reflections. Um, I want to, to highlight a point that I haven't seen very clear in the, in the presentations. I am a Latin American. And so I am accustomed to deal with disagreement in this region, which is very hard in the sense that I think that in this issue of learning, disagreement, uh, the um, polarization, etc., the issue of culture is basic in order to analyze the possibilities of uh, learning and teaching um from a point of view of uh, of uh, uh, Freire's perspective in the sense that if I am developing this kind of reflections or teaching with my Japanese students or in the north hmm, with the Swedish or, or Norwegian it's quite difficult to develop this kind of learning and dialogue while I am in with the Brazilians or the Colombians, for example. I mean, so the, the, the element of the, the culture from where they are coming and the way that they are accustomed to interact is as important as the methodology and steps that you develop in the education process. So I want to share this with you in order to see if you have the, the same idea so we can share some experience related to this. Even I have tried with same issues or themes you know, as a test. And then, well, you know, the possibilities of creating dialogue is quite difficult. So the, the cultural context, how it influenced the ways that you can develop dialogue and uh, critical thinking in the loops. That's it. 
Thank you, Alicia. Maybe I could start and then Maria and Bernadette could join us. I think, I think you're right when you talk about culture. From Brazil, we have a very authoritarian teaching culture where the teacher is the expert and the students are there just to listen most of the time. And it's quite hard to break that even when you are the teacher because when you don't put yourself as the expert in the room, you put yourself in a very vulnerable position. And you might have to say, I don't know, and that expose you to a, to a number of um, things you might not be ready to do yet. So in a way, that's, that's why we, the three of us are proposing this, this tension between feeling and understanding. That is not only a place of reason and a place of um, rationalizing that yes, we are, yes, we have oppression in society and yes, we should be fighting against oppression but it's also a place of feeling those feelings, even in your body. Like when you talk about anger, you, I can feel it on my chest. I can feel going through my throat. So how, how can I manage that? How can I experience that in the classroom, myself and the students, if I don't, if I, if I don't acknowledge both reason and emotion, both understanding and feeling? I, I don't have a solution. <laughs> I, just, I just think it's, it's accepting that it is a vulnerable place, and you have to be courageous to be there. Maria, would you like to add something? Um, yeah, probably I would say um, just to say this one is that uh, just coming back to Latin America from New Zealand, one of the most important experiences I, I had there uh, was living among um, Maori scholars who were trying hard to create an understanding in both Maori and non-Maori uh, student population of what is the, the depth of the concept, culturally responsive pedagogies. Because I think that as Alicia is mentioning, we, we need to experience that with so many different cultures. In the context of New Zealand, uh, what I what I experience, of course, this is um, something that I was just exposed to during the six years of, my, of living there, but is um, helping all of us, as I, again, as I say, Maori and non-Maori, to uh, imagine a different type of classroom where we can actually try to understand what is relevant from the point of view of a different culture. But because we are not used to you wearing those lenses, the teacher needs to create an environment that is safe for different cultures to express themselves, not to park the culture at the door. And now that I came to Colombia and I am working with the Embera population a little bit more and trying to understand what are the challenges in a culture that is used to um, relate through art, through weaving, weaving, but not talking. You don't need to talk much if you can express yourself in the art that you are creating. So how can we provide a safe environment in a culturally diverse school, culturally diverse classroom for these particular ways of being and learning to manifest. We are trying here in our group to connect ethics of care and critical pedagogies, for example. And uh, we are trying to think more and more how these environments can be created, both critical and caring caring for this multiplicity of cultures. So um, I'm really grateful, Alicia, that you raised up um, that opportunity for us to discuss about this. Thank you. I'm afraid I'm gonna to have to call it because we've gone slightly over. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us and for participating. I know there's a lot in the chat still. A big thank you to our guests, um, our guests, both of them, Gina McCrane and Ine Afioli. Um, if
if there's interest, we might run something similar again in the future in a different format, perhaps more discussion. We'd like to hear from you. Um, in a moment, I log out of the meeting and it will be discontinued. Um, but I will uh, have that recording and put it up online for anyone that's interested. Take care. Have a great day, evening, night, depending on where you are in the world. And hopefully we'll get to interact again soon. Thank you all. Bye. Yeah,